Um, so for this week, I'm going to present um, this benchmarking paper um, uh, that was in Nature's Communication last year. Um, uh, so it's bench benchmarking cell type deconvolution pipelines for transcriptomics data. Um, and basically, they compare a bunch of different deconvolution methods that are, are out there um, on some, some standardized data. Um, so the goals and methods of this paper, um, yeah, so basically we wanna compare a bunch of different uh, deconvolution methods um, and how basically their results and accuracy change as we transform the data different, in different ways. Um, we do uh, different scaling and normalization techniques, um, different marker selections, uh, and different cell compositions in the reference data. Um, so they compare 20 different methods. Um, they use 15 uh, methods that use just the bulk data and rely on um, like a regression from the bulk data. Uh, and they use five different uh, single cell RNA-seq reference methods, which is um, kind of more the realm that we've been working on. So that's what I'm gonna focus. Um, that's like the side of the paper I'm gonna focus on more here. Um, and then that includes music and disc, which um, I've been working with quite a bit. And the last talk I gave at Journal Club was on disc. So I'm sure everybody's heard me talk about these two methods quite a bit. Um, and they have five different um, single nucleus RNA sequence data sets. Um, so they use those to basically create like huge sets of um, like suitable data where they know the ground truth because they've generated um, these different cell mixtures like with the single cell data. So we know exactly the proportion um, because it's something that we've discussed is like knowing that ground truth is, is pretty tricky. Um, so this way we have like a clean truth and we have a huge number of samples to test all of these um, methods over. Um, and they basically evaluate um, on two main, uh, they look at two main uh, sources of, or I guess like, what am I trying to say? Measurements of accuracy. Um, so root mean squared error. So based off like the known proportion of cells and the predicted proportion of cells by each method. And they also look at the Pearson correlation between the known truth and um, the predicted truth. Um, so those are like their two main um, factors that they present in a bunch of these different um, figures in the paper. And then they also have a, uh, I guess like a real data set um, where they have flow sorted peripheral bl blood mononuclear cells um, that were flow sorted. So we like have a sense of like what the real proportion is. Um, so they kind of do like a quick example run with that real data. Um, so in their figure one, they kind of just show the schematic of like how they set up this paper. Um, so this is like the data they have um, different transformations, normalizations, and then like the different methods. So, so the first thing that they look at was data transformation. Um, so they apply four different data transformations to this suitable data um, for our linear, which is basically they do nothing. Um, there's like no transformation. And, um, and then they take the log of the counts square root of the counts. And then VST was the only one I was not familiar with. And it's a uh, variant stabilization transformation, which I, my understanding is that it basically like removes the reliance of the mean. That's at least how they summarized it in their method section. Um, but basically their finding was that uh, the linear transformation is like by far the most accurate in each method. Um, I think I just put the single cell results here, but um, also for the bulk methods, the, the linear AKA no transformation is like um, the best way to go. And that's what they use moving forward for the rest of the methods. The second test they did was checking out different normalization techniques on different, different normalization techniques on the data and then over each method. Um, and I, and for each of these tests, it's like a, it's a thousand different um, sets. It's like they make a thousand suitable mixes and then uh, apply all these different, or apply the normalization and then uh, process it with the different techniques. Um, 
So for this, oh, for this figure, um, yeah, uh, basically um, in this top box, this is the bulk methods. So the different columns are the different um, transformations. So they have none, row normalization column, column min max, et cetera. And then the different rows are the different methods that they use. And then to represent the accuracy, there's like two different things that change here. So the color represents the Pearson correlation. Um, the more blue, the more accurate it is. And then um, the size of each point represents one over the root mean squared error. So the larger the point is, the smaller the root mean squared error is. So basically things that are performing, or I guess like um, combinations that perform well have these larger blue spots. And then the combinations that perform poorly have the smaller, more orange spots. Um, and then for the single cell, it's a little more complicated because they transform both the reference data and the bulk data. So that's why each method has its own kind of matrix of spots um, where the, um, they scale the single cell on the, wait, I have to move this. I forget which axis is which. Um, single cell is the x-axis, uh, no? I think, yeah, I think so. It's scaling C versus scaling T. Yeah, I feel like that would make sense. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a, a matrix for each point. Um, and I think that their main takeaways from this is that uh, there's some general patterns for which um, normalizations perform better, but overall, like different things impact different methods um, differently. <laughs> but I think that normal like the none column does pretty well almost everywhere, um, which is reassuring. Um, and I think that there's also, they also mention one of these methods, like some of these methods are designed to work with specific, um, specific normalizations. I think TPM is the one that they pull out in the paper. And basically they say like the ones that stood out to them were these worst performing ones, which is um, column and row min max, um, which I think are these. I think that's not even compatible with a lot of these methods, which is what are the, the missing points, oh, sorry. And then um, they also mentioned that for this, BISC kind of performs pretty, pretty poorly compared to these other single cell methods. But they mentioned that with this specific example, they had used like kind of a low number of individual donors for the single cell. And they know that BISC works better with more donors. So that's something that they, they brought up. And it's also been relevant to our work because we've been using BISC on a data set with not a lot of donors, but hopefully we're getting more donors in the future. So we hope to see that accuracy bump up. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right. All right, moving on to the um, their next test, which was marker selection. So they actually didn't perform this with single nucleus, with any of the single nucleus RNA-seq methods, which is a bummer because that's like of interest to us because we've been working a lot with like thinking about how to do marker selection and how to like narrow in how many genes we use for this deconvolution. Um, but I kind of liked the way that they did this. Um, they kind of use different subsets of genes, which are these different colors. So they go from using all the genes to positive log full change. Um, and then they kind of have a spectrum and then they have kind of some negative controls, which I thought was smart. So they use like a random five and they also have a bottom 50 average expression and a bottom 50% log full change. So basically they use some genes that they expect to not be good for finding these cell types as markers. Um, and kind of what they saw is that the all markers performed the best with the selection for a positive full change being very close to the performance for um, all markers. So that's this lightest green and this light yellow. Um, yeah. So I thought that was interesting and um, might be something we check out in uh, our kind of our own like deconvolution benchmark exploration we're, we're on. Um, so the next steps they do is they checked out what happens basically if they knock out any of the cell types, or like a group of cell type or 
one cell type from the reference data. So basically what they did was they, um, one at a time, they remove a cell type from the data. Um, so I think that there's like a set of six cells. So this first column is just like the standard data and the deconvolution they get using all cell types in the reference. And then for each of these next columns, this name at the top represents the name of the cell that they knock out. And then you can see how the proportion of the other cell types change. Um, so yeah, all of these only have five out of, or four out of the five cell types. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so they, um, just focusing on the single, the, the single cell reference methods, um, basically they say that DWLS and music both suffer from accuracy when any of these cell types are missing. As you can see that these kind of jump around, they don't look like this, um, this first column. Um, the proportions change quite a bit when we lose one of the cell types. Um, they also mentioned, which I thought was interesting, that the cell type um, that is the most similar to the missing cell type can ab like absorb the proportion of that missing cell type. Um, so I I'll see if we can find a good. That's what they're trying to get at with these correlation graphs down here. Um, so cell types with high correlation, see like beta and delta have a pretty high correlation here. Will we knock out the beta cell? Um, I think delta jumps way up from where it is here. So that's something interesting. And I think that's something um, that like we're gonna have to be careful with with our, our own data. Um, and then one of the last things that they discuss is they applied all these methodologies to uh, their real data set, which is that um, the flow sorted blood data. Um, so they have nine examples and they call this like their gold standard is the um, flow cytometry. Um, so they didn't run music or SCDC on this uh, because they only have one they only have one individual for the single nucleus RNA reference. Um, so that's why they're missing from this single cell. But basically we kind of get like a, a widespread of performances across the different methods. Um, we also see that same pattern that we saw with the, the pseudoblock data where the different transformations kind of perform differently across the different methods. Everything's sensitive to its own thing and each method has its own quirks. Um, but I think that they say that like DWLS performs better than BISC here, but like, like they mentioned, like there's only one reference and we know for a fact that this does not do well with one reference. So it might've been kind of an unfair comparison. Um, but yeah, that's the, we see their performances overall. Um, um, and the, at the very end of the um, paper, they wrap up with five main takeaways. Um, so keep the data in the linear scale, um, no transformations. So I think that that's nice. And that kind of goes along with the second one, it's like, don't use row scaling, the column min max or Z scale. Z score like also aren't good transformations, but um, also I thought that like the no normalization also looked like it worked. So like, if you're doing this for yourself, like you don't have to justify why you did any of these transformations, just like that was the data. Um, and they also recommend pairing regression bulk and single nucleus RNA-seq analysis together. Um, like if the data is available for single nucleus RNA-seq, um, that's not something we're really implementing. We're kind of just focusing on the single nucleus side, um, but that's something that they recommend. And then four was their, my favorite point. That's why I put it in bold, but on um, this stringent marker selection strategy, focusing on the differences between the first and second cell type with the highest expression value. And I think that the first time I read this paper, that was like an exciting point to hear because that's when we had been discussing kind of our mean ratio strategy. Um, which some of you, I might have talked with some of you about. Um, but that, that kind of like goes along with the strategy we've been using. So that was nice to see in a, a paper. Um, and then their fifth point is use the reference data that includes all, this, all the cell types that are going to be present in your bulk data, um, which I think that like they bring up and they show that like that can really impact your data. But I'm not sure how to do that totally. Like I'm, I think, um, like they don't really mention how to ensure that you've done that, um, but it might be something to think about going forward. Yeah, so that was uh, 
that was that paper. Hope you guys liked it.